All right. It's great to be with each one of you here today. We are continuing our series, Reconsider. Let's open in a word of prayer, and then we will get into God's word together. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to study your word. I pray that you would not only open our eyes and our ears to hear, but open our hearts to receive the truth. God, I pray that today would be encouraging. I pray that it would be informative and that it would help us to consider the reasons that many walk away from the faith and the reasons we have to stick around, to continue to pursue you by faith uh, with confidence in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, in your spirit, amen. Well, for those who are just tuning in, we are continuing our series called Reconsider. And we've said every person who has ever struggled with doubt, every person who's ever walked away from the faith has asked two questions and answered at least one of them negatively. The two questions are, is it true? Is it worth it? Because if we're not convinced it's true, then we're never going to follow. And if we're not convinced that it's worth it, we may be convinced intellectually that God exists, that God's word is true, but we're not actually convinced emotionally or willfully. And so God's calling us to do things in his word or calling us to obey in ways that we just don't want to do because we go, well, I think it's true, but I don't think the payoff of following Jesus is really worth the effort. And so the big idea that we're making is the heart will never embrace what the mind has rejected. And so throughout, throughout this series, what we're doing is we're dismantling reasons people have to doubt that the Bible is true or to doubt that it's worth it. And the point we're making here is that many really sincere people walk away from God for really bad reasons without really understanding the reasons they used to do so. Let me just summarize that. Many people are convinced that the Bible isn't true or that following Jesus isn't worth it, but they've been convinced by really bad arguments. Now, I'm not saying there aren't arguments in order that we need to consider as Christians and that have weight to them, but what I'm saying is the ones that often convince the most people, they ain't it, okay? Uh, we, we get convinced by arguments that sound good at first, but when you look closer at them, they really fall apart. And this is what Proverbs tells us. Proverbs 18, 17, kind of our theme verse for this series. The first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. So we are looking at eight reasons that people walk away from Christianity. And we're examining them again and going, maybe you need to reconsider these. If these are the reasons you're doubting or these are the reasons that you have walked away from faith, you need to reconsider because these are bad arguments, right? And the first one that we looked at last time was I don't have to consider Christianity because science has buried God. Today we're going to unpack myth number two. I don't have to consider Christianity because the Bible has been changed. Uh, many people, when we talk about the history of how we got the Bible that's in front of us, many people think it's like the telephone game. Do you remember playing the telephone game when you were uh, kids where you start over here, for example, and one person gets a message whispered and they have one chance to pass it on to the next and on to the next and on to the next. And by the time it gets from there all the way through and then all the way down to over here, the message has been completely distorted. That's how many people think we got the Bible. And the reality is, is this is powerful for people because if we can't trust that what we have now is what they wrote then, then are we really morally responsible to do what it says? After all, if we don't know what it said, we don't have to believe or do what it says. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, the Apostle Paul says this about the Bible. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. When we consider the nature of scripture, the Bible says that it is from God, that it is written by men, in the, uh, it is the words of God written by men, and that because it is divinely inspired, the word there isn't inspired like uh, I was inspired to write something. The word inspired there is better translated as all scripture is God-breathed. Because it's from God, 
It carries an authority. It carries a uh, divine mandate with it. But there are three charges that are made against the Bible today. Number one, the Bible was written by men, not God. After all, it wasn't Jesus who's writing these things. It wasn't God who with his mighty finger comes and writes these things on a scroll. No, it was Moses. It was Paul. It was John. These are the thoughts of men, the charge goes. And that's it. Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, says, to be fair, much of the Bible is not systematically evil, but just plain weird. As you would expect of a chaotically cobbled together anthology of disjointed documents, composed, revised, translated, and distorted, and improved by hundreds of anonymous authors, editors, and copyists, unknown to us, and mostly unknown to each other, spanning nine centuries. His whole point is this is simply a human book, and it looks like a human book. It, it doesn't go together. The books contradict one another. The authors, we don't even know who they are, and they don't know who each other are. Bart Ehrman uh, has made this second uh, criticism, the second charge. There are so many copy errors, we can't know what the Bible said. So even if the Bible was written uh, by men, called by God, it's been copied so many times and translated so many times, we can't really have any confidence in what it said. Bart Ehrman, again, he's probably the leading uh, New Testament critic of today, at least in terms of popular writing. He writes, the Old Testament is filled with lots of textual problems, as we have come to realize, for example, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But he goes on, it gets even worse for the New Testament in his mind. Scholars differ significantly in their estimates. Some say there are 200,000 variants, some say 300,000, some say 400,000 or more. There are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Now that's a powerful charge right there, isn't it? His whole point is, when we look at the manuscript copies we have of the New Testament, there are so many differences between them, kind of again, the telephone game where it's gone from first century all the way to our day, there's so many differences that we don't even know what the original said. And then number three, the church left out books it didn't like or that contradicted them. Uh, this is actually the claim of the movie or the book, depending on, you know, if you're like me and you'd rather watch the movie than read the book, uh, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, in The Da Vinci Code, the whole point is Jesus actually had a wife named Mary Magdalene, and they had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids, and that line has survived all the way to today, and they call that truth that the church has pushed down the Holy Grail, right, from King Arthur, but it wasn't a cup, it was a mysterious, a mysterious truth that the church had hidden. And at the Council of Nicaea, they decided, well, we're only going to use books and put these books together that, um, that, that call Jesus God. And the rest, we're going you know, to kind of shy away from them. Um, I, ended, I watched The Da Vinci Code with my wife when it came out, and uh, she thought we were just going to have a nice movie night. Uh, no, if you know me, that's, that's not how this goes. I had like four church history books out, and I'm going, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. And she goes, well, you just be quiet and watch the movie. Uh, she should have known me better by then. <laughs> The charge is that the church left out books it doesn't like or didn't like or that contradicted them, and so we can't actually trust that the books we have are accurate. But here's the point I want to make for you today. When it comes to what the Bible is and what we have in front of us, the Bible is a perfect message from God. God has communicated and spoken to us through writing. The Bible is a perfect message from God that has been reliably passed on to us. As we consider this message, I want to talk about three reasons you can have confidence in the Bible in front of you. The first is this. The Bible was written by men under the inspiration of God. Yes, it was written by men using their own distinct personalities, using their own situations. They were writing letters, for example, the New Testament. They were writing letters to churches because the churches were going through things, they were facing things. So Paul, John, these guys, as they're writing, they are writing in a human manner. But the Bible itself claims to be more than that. We already read 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, 
The Bible was written by men, but it was written by men called, equipped, and guided by the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible itself claims. Now, you can deny that claim. You can reject that claim. But to say the Bible is merely a human book denies what the Bible authors claim for themselves. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 1. This is written by the Apostle Peter a follower of Jesus, and he says, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales. I want you to think through what he's actually claiming here. We did not uh, follow cleverly devised tales, but we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made by him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When did that happen? Right, when Jesus was baptized, Peter saying, I, we were witnesses. We saw these things. When Jesus was transformed on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter's going, we were witnesses. We saw these things. But I want you to notice what he goes on to say. And we ourselves heard this declaration from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. But then notice this language. So we have the prophetic word. What prophetic word? We're going to find out in just a second. Made more sure. In other words, we have something that is more sure than even Peter's own experience. To which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy ever, or no prophecy is a matter of of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will but men moved by the holy spirit what does the language say spoke from god these men were called by god and were superintended by his spirit to write what god wanted them to write it's not that god dictated it to them okay god didn't go uh Paul an apostle, and then Paul wrote Paul an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not dictation theory, but God, so in his sovereignty, supervised and moved over these authors so that what they wrote was what he wanted us today to know. It had a historical context, but it looks beyond the historical context to be universal truth for the people of God. So number one, the Bible was written by men, but it was written by men called, equipped, and guided by the Holy Spirit. Number two, Jesus affirmed the divine authority of Scripture written by men. Notice what he says in Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Do not presume that I came to do what? Abolish the law and prophets. No, he didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. Notice the, the, the idea of law and prophets. That is a summary term of the Old Testament. You had the books of the law, you had the prophets. He says what they wrote, I didn't come to abolish it, I came to fulfill it. In other words, Jesus treated the law and prophets as if they were prophecy from God to be fulfilled. He goes on, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. But that's not all he says. He goes on, Mark 12 24, when he's arguing with the religious leaders, he says, is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures nor the power of God? He is equating their lack of understanding of scripture with their lack of understanding of God. Why? Because he put those things together. For Jesus, the Old Testament was authoritative, divine revelation even though it was the work of Moses, even though it was the work of Samuel, even though it was the writing of David, even though it was written by the prophets. When people argue that what matters is what Jesus said and not what the other authors of biblical books wrote, we call this red-letter Christianity, the idea that all that matters in your Bible are the words in red in the Gospels, because that's what Jesus said. Um, there was a popular cartoon, Bible cartoon, that was uh, when I was like, early high school um, I loved it but I don't want to I don't want to name it because I don't want to criticize because I love the show so much 
But one of the songs they, they did uh, for kids said, the, the red words are the coolest. They're the ones that Jesus said. That is not Jesus' own attitude about Scripture. Jesus' own attitude about Scripture is that he affirmed the writings of men as ultimately divinely authoritative. Um, and for, uh, on that note, remember when Jesus is being tempted in uh, the wilderness by Satan? How does he beat Satan? Satan comes and goes, well, you know, if you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, do this. And Jesus doesn't say, who are you to talk to me that way? He says, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he quotes the book of Deuteronomy. How does Jesus beat the devil? Quoting scripture, right? So then, uh, number three, letter C, the divine authority of the words of men is seen in the power of those words to predict the future, prophecy, to make sense of the world around us, biblical worldview, and to change lives. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, I love this verse. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to, uh, penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit about joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The proof of the word of God is self-attesting because the proof is in its effect upon our lives. Ultimately, the reason we know the Bible is the word of God, it claims to be the word of God, and it has the power to transform lives. Listen, I've messed up a lot in my life. I really have. I still think that the reason God called me to be a pastor is because I've done so many dumb things in my life, I can have compassion on other dumb people, okay? It, it's true. But you know, I have never disobeyed God and life ever got better for me. Not once. And I have never obeyed God and regretted it. That's the power of God's word. That's something that human authors don't do. Like, there may be a lot of smart people in the world. There may be a lot of wise people in the world. But the divine authority of God's word is seen in the fact that when you do it, when you obey, it transforms your life. I've had the privilege as a biblical counselor to walk with people through hard times. And when they obey God, it's amazing what God does in their marriage, in their home, with their kids, with their parents, with their friends, with uh, uh, their outlook, with their addictions. It's amazing what God's word does to transform your life in ways that no human book does. David Dockery and David Nelson say this, Scripture cannot be rightly understood unless we take into consideration that it has dual-sided authorship. What must be affirmed is that the Bible is entirely and completely the word of God and the words of human authors. It is the word of God written in the words of men. When we consider the nature of the Bible, it claims to be more than the word of men. It claims to be the word of God. Number two, uh, not only do we have the Bible was written by men under the inspiration of God, but we also have the point I want to make that the, pro the process of canonicity isn't complicated. The process of selecting books isn't complicated. Like, how do we decide which books of the Bible belong and which ones don't? Is there some vast conspiracy? Well, let me ask you this. If you were to be put in charge, let's say they come to you and let's say they put Bob or, or, or Anna or whatever in charge of uh, selecting the books of the Bible, okay? I don't know if we want Bob in charge of that, but whatever, okay. <laughs> uh, let's say they put you in charge of that. What would you do? Like, what criteria would you have? You know what I bet? I bet you'd ask questions like, who wrote it? You'd ask questions like, why'd they write it? You ask questions like, okay, do other Christians like get this? Are they getting the same vibe from us? Right. Does the book have a divine origin? In other words, was it written by a person who was called to and enabled to speak for God? Remember that the, the biblical books were not written by random people. They were written by people who could write scripture. Moses, to whom God appeared. Samuel, the judge of Israel. David, the king of Israel. The prophets, to whom God spoke, they prophesied. The apostles who followed Jesus. 
Letter B, does the book have a divine purpose? Does it serve to edify and religiously instruct God's people in a way that is consistent with other books? For example, we have the Gospels, we have uh, Peter, we have uh, John, these were the apostles of Jesus. A book that claims to be scripture but contradicts what the apostles are saying that they got from Jesus is probably not a book we should put into the Christian canon, right? And it's not that we're deciding which books. What we're trying to do is we're trying to recognize which books are inspired, right? So think of it this way. Uh, when you have, when, when you have a, a hot room, for example, okay, um, you have a thermostat, and the job of the thermostat is to what? To control the temperature, right? It determines what the temperature is going to be. But what is the job of a thermometer, right? If it's 80, if it says it's 80 degrees on the thermometer on the wall, like the thermometer didn't cause the 80 degrees in the room, right? The thermometer simply recognizes what temperature it is. The church does not decide which books are going to be in and which are not. The job of the church is to recognize which books are inspired by God. And they ask, okay, well, who wrote it? Does it have a divine origin? Okay, well, uh, does it have a divine purpose? Does it match what we know the apostles taught, for example? And then number three, does it have a divine reception? Here's what I mean. Number one, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament, as we already saw, and foretold the new. In John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, Jesus argues that when, or, uh, declares that when he ascends, after his ministry on earth is done, when he ascends to go to be with the Father, he will send another, a helper, a comforter, an encourager, to come alongside. This is something that's true for all of us. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us. But in John 16, he's specifically talking to the apostles, and here's what he's telling them. He says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them at the present time. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own. Jesus says, when I go, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to enable you to remember the things I told you, so that you can pass that on. Number two, the biblical writers affirmed each other. Over and over and over, scriptural writers quote other scriptural writers. So this idea that Dawkins has, for example, that we don't know who wrote it, that's not true in the vast majority of cases, um, except for maybe a handful of books. Uh, number two, that they don't even know each other. That is certainly not true. Over and over, they quote each other. Let me give you an example here. One of my favorite passages here, Second Peter. And I'll tell you, I know I say one of my favorite passages a lot because the whole Bible is pretty great. But uh, this is uh, particularly for one reason. The Apostle Peter here is writing against false teachers. And I want you to notice the language that he uses here. Okay, Second Peter chapter 3, 15 through 16. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as also our beloved brother who? Paul. Peter knew Paul. And notice, it's not just that Peter knew Paul. Whoever Peter is writing to knew Paul. You see, we often think of the Bible books as if they exist in isolation historically. That's not true. These were letters written to people who knew the people Peter's mentioning offhand, like Paul. Like these people to whom uh, Peter is writing knows who Paul is. In other words, Paul was a historic individual, as is Peter. Okay? And when people say, well, we don't know that Peter wrote this. Well, that's awfully strange. Given that, the people to whom Peter is, the, the author is writing, they certainly think it's Peter. And Peter, the author here, whoever it is, is referencing another person that they know, okay? The, the, the author of Peter uses language about being eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry and references Paul, okay? But notice what he does here. This is great. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, speaking of the Holy Spirit's ministry, wrote to you, as also in all his letters. So Peter not only knows that Paul exists, Peter not only knows that Paul is one of us, but he also knows that Paul is writing letters. What's up with that, right? But then I love this. 
in which <laughs> some things are hard to understand. I love this. If Peter reads what Paul writes about predestination, about, the, the, about high Christology, and, and even Peter looks at it and goes, yeah, I have no idea what he's talking about. Like, that's an incredibly encouraging thing to me, right? Um, when I read it and I go, man, what is Paul, what is he going on about? If even Peter's confused, then it's okay for us to be confused. But it says, notice, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught, talking about false teachers, untaught and unstable, distort. False teachers come in and they say, well, Paul said this, and what he meant was, and they have some weird interpretation that's not at all what Paul meant. But now here's the key. They distort it as they do the rest of the, what? Scriptures. Peter, the follower of Jesus, equates what Paul is writing with Scripture. Right? So the idea that Peter and Paul are writing books that they had no idea that these, this was Scripture, that's not historically true. They understood they were writing with divine authority. And then number three, the church affirmed the same books. What do we mean? Number one, when we read the history of the church, and I have um, on my shelf, it's called the Anti-Nicene Fathers, uh, and then you have the Post-Nicene Fathers as well. It's this massive set, um, dozens of volumes. Uh, the Anti-Nicene Fathers is a, uh, a collection of books that is... Uh, that covers the first 300 years of the church. Okay? It is everything we have from the first several centuries, just about everything we have from the church fathers uh, for the first three centuries. And I've read the whole thing cover to cover. Okay? And you know what you find? Over and over and over, the church quote, or the early church fathers quote the writings of Scripture, of the New Testament. They do it over and over. Hundreds of times, dozens, thousands of times, um, one person has estimated close to 36,000 times the uh, early church quoted passages from the New Testament. And I want you to notice they consistently quote, but number two, they also list them as scripture. I want you to check out this graph here. Scripture took time, it's true, to be recognized, or it, it took time for the canon, the list of books, to be recognized as, well, it, which ones belong, which ones don't. It took time, and you can see over uh, several hundred years here, as it develops, um, that you have um, a development, <laughs> as it develops, you have a development, of um, inclusion. So you have the first time there's like a list of which books belong in the writings of the fathers. You have Luke, and you have the ten letters of Paul. Then as we go on, we find, well, actually, you also have Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter. Other ones, the apostolic canon, uh, includes every book that we have in our New Testament, but they didn't include the book of Revelation. Then you get to the Council of Nicaea, and all of the ones that we have in our Bible are listed. Then you get to um, various uh, collections that you have, all except 2nd Thessalonians and 2nd John. Then you get to all, again, uh, in 350, all except for several of these, all except Hebrews, James, and John. And by 367, the canon lists that we find in church history are universal. Now, you go, well, then why did they disagree? Here's what you have to remember. Was Christianity legal for the first 300 years? No, it wasn't. And Christians faced intense persecution. And so it's not like today where we can email each other, right? They, were, they couldn't gather publicly. They couldn't discuss these things publicly. So Paul writes a letter to Ephesus, and it gets copied and passed around there, but not everybody around the world gets it. And he writes this letter to the Galatians, and Peter writes this letter over here, and John writes these letters over here. And they do get passed around, but not everybody gets them. And so when you get to the 300s and Constantine makes Christianity legal, they're finally able to gather. And when they're gathering together at these various councils, they're like, okay, which books do you have? Which ones do we have? And they're comparing. And it does take some time for them to read, process, acknowledge. But what we find is when they saw them, they're like, yeah, this is, this is clear. Okay. Here's the question then. What about other books? 
What about other books? Books like the Gospel of Thomas, books like the Gospel of Peter. Um, books that bear the name, we call them um, pseudepigrapha, false writings, um, that bear the name of apostles. Why are they included? You know, it's interesting. People love books like the Gospel of Thomas. It's a supposed collection of Jesus' uh, stories that weren't included, sayings and, and stories. Um, the Da Vinci Code, love the book, The Gospel of Thomas. <laughs> And as, uh, uh, because it, it talks about Jesus having women followers, it talks about Jesus um, uh, uh, being more inclusive, and so they love that. You know what's interesting? The Gospel of Thomas says, if unless a woman become a man, uh, they cannot uh, uh, become a follower of Jesus. <laughs> um, that, that's a little weird, right? The Gospel of Peter is interesting. It talks about Jesus coming out of the tomb and his body is a normal height, but his head goes from his neck all the way up into the heavens. Like the ultimate like DK mode from the old Nintendo 64, right? Uh, it's, it, it's weird, right? It doesn't match what we actually know the apostles wrote. So I just want to make three points here. Number one, many of the writings that we have, sorry, many of the writings contain ideas that contradict the apostles' doctrine. Number two, the books are too late to be generally, or sorry, genuinely uh, apostolic or to be serious opposition. These books that people wonder why they were left out, we're not talking about first century books that are contemporary with the apostles as they're writing. No, we're talking about books that are written in the second, third, fourth, and even fifth centuries, okay? So, it would not make sense to go, well, we're going to give them precedence over the books we know the apostles wrote. Okay? And then number three, there was never widespread support for canonizing any new, extra New Testament writing. Yeah, there were some questions about several of them, such as the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, uh, books that had great devotional value, whatever. But it never, they never received widespread support to be included. Okay? They recognize there's something different between the writings of these church fathers and writings uh, that are, have spiritual value but are not actually written by the apostles and those commissioned by them. Okay? So then number three, uh, as our, our big point, this is a big one, but it's uh, very important. Number three, we can reconstruct the text with great confidence. So the Bible was written by men under the inspiration of God. Number two, the process of selecting books really isn't complicated. And then number three, we can reconstruct the text with great confidence. Okay. Now, we're just going to focus on the New Testament here for the sake of time. Uh, in reference to Bart Ehrman's claim about the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, proving that the Old Testament is full of textual variants and errors, I, I just found that claim to be astounding. Because when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, they affirm the reliability of the Old Testament. I really don't know what on earth he's talking about. I love this quote. F.F. F. Bruce, who was a leading textual uh, scholar and New Testament scholar, said this, It may be now more confidently asserted than ever before that the Dead Sea Scroll discoveries have enabled us to answer this question of the Old Testament reliability in the affirmative with much greater assurance than was possible before 1948 when they were found. The Dead Sea Scrolls were these scrolls found in pots, in caves, in the Qumran community over in Israel. And uh, they were uh, scrolls of the Old Testament, among other things. And what we found is there was substantial agreement between the Old Testament and the New, or uh, uh, between the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, so we're, but we're going to focus on the New Testament here for the sake of time. So first we're going to ask the question, how did we get the New Testament? All right, so the idea is it starts in the mind of God. God communicates through human authors, and you have these human authors that are writing. You have Moses, or, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Peter, Jude, uh, the writer of Hebrews, <coughs> Barnabas, excuse me, uh, the writer of Hebrews, and then they make copies. And these copies were originally on things called, uh, on, on this, um, material called papyri. Papyri was pressed grass, okay? Now, did that last very long? No, it would often disintegrate. So we don't have a lot of papyri left, if almost anything, but what we do have is as the papyri develops, uh, originally it's written in what's called unseal script. This is all capital letters. As time goes on, minuscules, they begin to add, if this is all capitals, what is this? Right, it includes uh, lowercase letters. Lectionaries, these are early church collections, early versions. So think of it this way. In the first to fourth century, papyri was normally how things were written, but it didn't last long. 
Then you begin to see the uh, uh, emergence of vellum, which is, right, cheap skin, okay, uh, animal skin. And it's not until you get to the 13th century, 14th century, that you begin to see paper like what we have today. Uh, it began with things like scrolls, so you wouldn't um, have whole collections of books like what we have. You'd have a scroll of Mark, you'd have a scroll of John. Um, books like Isaiah in the Old Testament often have multiple scrolls because it was so long, okay? And they did it all by hand. And then you have unsealed script here, which, notice, this is Greek. They're all what? Yeah, they're all capital letters, okay? Until you get to minuscules in about the 9th century, 10th century, and then you begin to see lowercase letters being used, okay? So then as we go on, we find that uh, they made copies, and these copies were sent out all over the world. But notice, when they were sent to different parts of the world, um, manuscripts that were sent to different areas, as they're being copied and sent, remember, these aren't professional scribes in the case of the New Testament. They're just people who want other people to know what God says. So they're, they're grabbing pieces of paper, anything they can. They're writing it on things. They're sending it out. And it goes over here. Some copies go over here. Some copies go over here. And eventually, as they get there, and they're copied, 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 they began to take similar traits, okay? Similar traits to each other. We call these text families or text types, okay? And then, over time, uh, they are translated into various languages, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, English, German. Then you get to various translations that um, each have different ways of translating things. Uh, translation is uh, both a science and, frankly, an art. Okay? So here's the question then. If this is how we got the New Testament, why should we trust it? Um, and again, I just want to make four points uh, quickly here so we can keep moving. Number one, why should we trust it? Because we don't have the originals or close copies of any ancient work. When people say, all we have is copies of copies, I go, yeah, what do you expect? <laughs> we don't have the original of any ancient work, so to require that for Scripture is a false standard. It's not using equal scales. But then number two, we have an abundance of manuscripts. The issue is not that we don't have enough. The issue is we almost have too many, okay? But this is a good thing. I want you to think of it this way, okay? Uh, here's a graph that compares the manuscripts we have with the manuscripts of other ancient works. So you have Homer's book, The Iliad. Okay, we often know um, Homer from characters like the, uh, or books like The Odyssey, okay, with Odysseus. But uh, The Iliad is the story of the Trojan War. The, it was written around 800 BC. The earliest copy we have is around 400 BC. That's a time gap of 400. Do you know how many copies of that we currently have? 1900, and that's one of the best. Then you get to Plato's uh, Tetralogies, written about 400 B.C. The earliest copy we have is around 900 A.D. That's a 1,300-year gap. We have about 238, 240 of them. Tacitus was a leading Roman historian who wrote contemporaneously with the apostles. All right, so here we have um, somebody writing at the end of the first century, okay, this is going to be very comparable to Scripture. The, first cop the earliest copy we have is about 850, and that's only half of it. That's 750 years between the time it was written and the earliest copy we have, and we only have about 36 of those kinds of copies. You know what we have for Scripture? It's written between 50 and 90 A.D. We have fragments dated to around 150 A.D., that's a hundred years at the most difference. We have entire books, entire manuscripts of books, around 200. That's at the most 150 years. We have complete copies of Scripture, around 325 AD, of the, of the scriptural canon. That's 275. You know how many Greek manuscripts, just Greek language manuscripts we have? Over 5,800. Do you know how many non-Greek manuscripts we have of Syriac, Latin, Aramaic, Coptic? Over 18,000. So when you compare the Bible to other ancient manuscripts, it's not, even, it's not even close. And you say, well, there's so many copies. I understand that, but that's a good thing, and here's why. 
If there were three copies of Scripture and they had differences among them, we would be really in a pickle because we'd go, okay, well, I have this one, this one, this one. How do I know which one represents what was originally written? But if we have thousands, you know what we do? We compare them and certain readings rise to the top. And we go, okay, I can see which one was probably original. And yeah, it takes some intellectual effort, but it's very doable. And we can reconstruct the text with a great deal of confidence. Okay? Number uh, three, the differences themselves, further, are insignificant to teaching, to Christian teaching. Okay? When we're talking about the differences, what kinds of variants are we talking about? Here's what we're actually talking about. About 75% of the differences between the manuscripts, those 200,000 to 400,000 that Bart Amram was talking about, 75% of them are different ways of spelling words. Right. About 25% of them are word order differences or maybe some missing uh, fragments. Okay? Jesus Christ our Lord versus our Lord Jesus Christ. That type of thing. Only less than 1% of those variances are anything that actually make us go, we don't know what the original said with 100% certainty. Less than 1%. So you start knocking off those variants, and it's nowhere near as formidable. Now, we say, well, it's important to know what that less than 1% is. Listen, those things are things like the ending of the Gospel of Mark. It's true. Some of the earliest manuscripts we have do not include the ending of the Gospel of Mark. Most of the, the best manuscripts we have, the best early readings we have, also do not include that story in John 8 of the woman caught in adultery, um, where Jesus says, uh, he who is without sin cast the first stone. It's interesting. It's not in most of the early copies that we have of the Gospel of John. Um, and when it is in, we find it in different places. It's almost like it was a story that somebody knew of, and they put it in there to supplement what John is doing. Okay, But we're not hiding these things. If you look up these things in your Bibles, you know what you'll find? Any English translation, look it up, and there's brackets around these sections in your English translation. And if you look at the bottom of your Bible, it will say, the earliest manuscripts do not include these sections. Now they're going, you know what? We're not 100% sure, so we're going to put it in to be safe. We wouldn't want to get rid of it. But we have pretty good reason to say, mm, I don't think this is original to John's gospel. Right? These are historical questions. But if... The woman caught in adultery is not actually historically part of John's gospel, and the ending of Mark isn't. Does that mean God doesn't exist? No. Does that mean Jesus isn't God or didn't die or didn't rise? No. You know what's interesting? Bart Ehrman, who makes this big stink about, well, you know, there's all these variants. Here's what he says about the variants at the end of the same book. The essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. He goes, yeah, it doesn't actually affect like, what Christians believe, but their Bible isn't perfect. So, we have a reliable copy, more reliable than any other ancient work. Yeah, there's some questions, but never in the essential issues. Okay? Further, number four, the writing of the early church, the writings of the early church support the doctrines of the uh, New Testament documents. The generations of Christians who came after the writers of Scripture quote extensively from the New Testament, again, tens of thousands of times, and the major teachings of the New Testament are carried on in their writings. You know what we have? For example, we have Irenaeus writing in 180 AD. By 180 AD, okay, we're talking 100 years, not even, from the completion of the writing of the New Testament. For the Ebionites, this is a cult at the time. For the Ebionites who use Matthew's gospel only, they're going, oh, Matthew's the only gospel that's the word of God, are confuted out of the very same, making false suppositions with regard to the Lord. In other words, he goes, they say Matthew's the only gospel, but then when, if you actually read Matthew, it contradicts their own teaching. Okay? And then he says the same with what? Luke and with Mark and with John. By the end of the second century, by mid-second century, these are established as the Gospels. 
They knew them, they were written, and they were in circulation by mid-2nd century, less than 100 years after the completion of the New Testament. There's nothing like that in the ancient world. It's true. Clement of Rome, writing in the 1st century, 96 AD, writes, take up the epistle, the letter, of the blessed apostle Paul. Truly he wrote to you under the inspiration of of the Holy Spirit. So Paul was known in the first century. He was known as a follower of Jesus, and he was known to have written letters, and those letters were known to be Scripture. What we find is that the Bible is the best attested ancient work. It's not even close. That's why uh, Norman Geisler and William Nix write, the New Testament then has not only survived in more manuscripts than any other book from antiquity, but it has survived in a purer form than any other great book, a form that is 99.5% pure. What we actually have with Scripture is good reason to trust that what we have now is what they wrote then. Yeah, there's some question about some of them, and we're not hiding those, okay? I have this Bible here. This is a copy, this is one of my Greek New Testaments. If you open it up, this is the Greek New Testament, fourth revised edition. Um, and if you open it up, you have the text here. Uh, this is the letter to, this is the gospel according to John. And you have the Greek text here. And then you have all these notes in the apparatus at the bottom. You know what these are? These tell you where the manuscripts in here differ. We're not hiding this. We know these things. And your own Bibles point out some of the more significant ones. This is not a, a, a faith stopper. Certainly not the faith stopper that people think it is. If you read any ancient work and you have confidence in that, your confidence should more than quadruple with the Bible. If you trust those, you have no intellectual reason for distrusting the Bible. Yeah, there's some questions, but do some work. It's not difficult. Okay? First Th uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says this. The Apostle Paul writing, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of mere men or of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is also at work in you who believe. The apostle applauded this group of believers because when they received the word of God, written by men, they received it as divinely authored and divinely authoritative. You know, one of the reasons, and I think this is really what gets behind this issue, the reason we want to question whether or not we can trust this is because we don't want to trust this. Because if this is the revealed word of God, and if it's a reliable copy, then I have moral obligation to do what it says. See, we want to say it's not true because we don't want to obey it. Listen, Christian, Christian, we have every reason to trust that this is the message God wants us to know. Which means, one, you can trust it. And two, you are responsible to obey it. Here's some um, points or some uh, resources I want to leave you with. Uh, that's what we're going to do at the end of each of these times. Is I want to give you books that if you're like, hey, I want to know more about this. I'm going to go deeper into this. Great. Uh, Mal Couch wrote a book, God Has Spoken, Inspiration and Inerrancy. It's just a great introduction to the issues. Uh, how we, Norman Geiser and William Nix, From God to Us, How We Got Our Bible. Just a great history of textual variants. How do we think about this? How did the Bible come to us? And then Michael Kruger wrote a really great book, The Question of Canon, Challenging the Status Quo in the New Testament Debate. This is a little bit more advanced. Um, he has another one that I would also recommend. Uh, but this talks about, well, how did we decide which books belong, which ones didn't? It's a great resource uh, that basically expounds on what it is we were doing here. I hope this has been encouraging to you, and I hope that you go home and read your Bibles. Don't tell me you believe this is the Word of God when you won't read it. God has written you a letter. Take up and read. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for your word. Your word, which is a light to our path, 
Uh, God, I pray that we would take it, that we would read it, and that we would be changed. We know that Scripture is profitable. As 2 Timothy 3, uh, uh, 3 16 through 17 says, profitable for instruction, for correction, for re- uh, reproof, for uh, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God, I pray that we would, be, uh, that we would take seriously the Word of God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, in your spirit, amen. Have a blessed week.